I noted today that the, uh, the title of the conference was Innovation in Agriculture, Capturing the Opportunities, and the, the title of this afternoon's session was Production and Marketing Innovation in uh, Horticulture and Viticulture. What I'm going to do is I'm going to leave the details of the specific section um, heading to my learned colleagues here who will know way more about, uh, about the details of their particular areas than I ever could possibly know. But what I'd like to do is just to quickly run through what the government's doing to support innovation in the ag sector, or in, the, in this case, uh, horticulture and viticulture, to capture what I think are extraordinary opportunities that are currently before us. So, you know, there's certainly no doubt, I think most people would agree, that, uh, that horticulture and our viticulture slash wine industries are, are delivering pretty strong results at the moment, but I don't think anyone would suggest that we can't do better. Uh, I think the government's track record is, is reasonably good in demonstrating our commitment to you, and I can certainly assure you my commitment to horticulture and wine is extremely strong, although in, uh, in, November, in uh, February I wasn't a terribly good supporter of the wine industry because I did Feb fast, but you can be assured much I've tried to catch up. <laughs> but, uh, but um, you know, both uh, the agriculture competitiveness white paper and the innovation and science agenda have both been very much targeted towards um, assisting industry growth and profitability by putting serious dollars behind innovation. So um, our horticulture and, and wine sectors are, are already showing the benefits of the things like the, the free trade arrangements that we've put in place. Uh, and um, you know, there's some fantastic statistics uh, that are in support of these. Uh, for example, in the first 12 months following CHAFTA coming into force, horticultural exports, exports to China rose by 68% compared with the previous 12 months. Um, you know, table grapes is an example, tariff reductions from 13 to 5.2% have increased table grape exports by sixfold um, to 102 million for the first 10 months of 2016. And in the first 12 months following uh, the Japan-Australia Economic Partnership, uh, we saw exports to Japan rise by 40% in comparison to the previous 12 months. So there's some really, really good news stories out there at the moment about some of the things that are actually happening on the back of that one particular um, initiative. And similar statistics can be quoted for the wine industry. Um, so we're certainly seeing excellent results in global markets and we expect to see opportunities for horticulture and the wine industries continue to grow as global demand grows for a clean, green, quality produce and the premium produce, the non-commoditised produce that we grow in Australia. So we maintain our focus on these uh, trade arrangements, not just negotiating these trade arrangements and new trade arrangements, but also improving market access into these markets. And I was very pleased coming from the Riverland in South Australia, a, a stone fruit area, to see that where our first shipment of Australian nectarines went to China in November this year, um, untreated because of the recognition of our pestry status. But market access is only one piece of, uh, of the picture. And, uh, when it comes to realising our opportunities. And I mean, I think I said this morning, it was quite interesting, it's funny how you say one controversial comment and that's the only thing that hits the media when I was asked whether I thought we were doing enough for biosecurity. You know, Senator says government not doing enough for biosecurity, funny about that. But, um, you know, our clean and green um, horticultural produce and our quality wine um, shows absolutely no sign of, of slowing down. But the cost of protecting that particular image is something that I think is probably one of the most important things that a government will ever do. So we place huge importance on uh, the R&D to help us um, with man managing or, or protecting against threat of incursion. And whilst this particular issue obviously presents us with massive challenges um, because of the length of our coastline, because of the amount of uh, points of entry into the country and all those things that happen when you've got a great big land mass and a very small population, I think it also gives us a marvellous opportunity for value add on our produce. Because one of the big issues that we're starting to see, particularly out of Asia, is the counterfeiting of product. And so Asian countries are now looking to Australia for things to be packaged instead of arriving in bulk. So therefore, for the very first time in a very long time, food manufacturing is something that's back on the agenda and we can demand a premium for our products if we're processing them more than we currently are because traceability is the number one ticket item that seems to be sitting on my desk at the moment, particularly for the maintenance of, or the development of our trade. And I mean, I don't know whether I've said this so often, I've actually made it into being true, 
but um, my advice is that of the seven bottles of Grange that are sold in China at the moment, only one of them will actually be Grange. Um, now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. It, it, it highlights the situation, but I'm going to keep saying it because I think it sounds really, really emphasises the point that I'm making, and that is the opportunity for Australia to value add our product is, is absolutely real. This is our big chance, and if we're clever, we can grasp it. Um, so, ABEARS um, have predicted um, a massive increase in demand for our, our fruit and vegetables and our wine exports to China are already increasing so that they're such that they're in excess of the USA. And the volatility of the USA market and our tr traditional markets of the UK and Europe um, do present a really interesting challenge for us about what are we doing in this marketing space. Um, so, you know, there's certainly no doubt our reputation um, and our position in the region um, as a, and, and as a reliable supplier of quality agri agricultural uh, exports and, and our favourable market access um, is going to give us an edge. We will none the face, uh, nonetheless face extraordinary stiff competition from, from overseas countries who seek also to go into those markets. So we must never take, sire, take um, as our eyes off increasing productivity and profitability as part of the equation when it comes to ensuring that farm businesses can capture the opportunities that are before them. Uh, and that's why we're very focused on supporting farm businesses to become more productive and profitable. So, you know, many of the broader things that we're doing in the business environment, like, you know, um, you know, fairer tax arrangements and more streamlined regulation, are things that we want to do to make sure that your life is easier. For the horticulturalists uh, uh, amongst us, one of the things that um, I'm f in the final stages of uh, doing is to review the horticultural code of conduct so that we can make sure that we support constructive and fair business relationships between um, horticultural growers and traders. Um, in particular, the code will seek to improve um, you know, guidance to traders and, uh, and growers when how to comply with the code, uh, ensure that they both have a, you know, a fair produce market agreements to, to fall back on in their trading relationships, and making sure that the ACCC is not encumbered by cumbersome um, regulation when small breaches occur they can be easily dealt with so they don't happen again. Another one, obviously, is new country of origin labelling laws that are set to come in. You know, no longer will you just be able to sort of chop it up and chuck it in another packet and, cl and claim that it's an Australian produce. Um, the Australian made claim will be exactly that. It has to be Australian made or Australian produced, otherwise you won't have the luxury of putting that on your product, which hopefully will see um, not just a, you know, uh, the benefits of our export markets, but it will give us the competitive advantage in our Australian markets that we, we so deserve, as far as I'm concerned. Um, we're also encouraging investment in, in infrastructure, like water infrastructure. Um, Barnaby was very, very keen to make sure that he got a $500 million, um, $500 million um, amount put away in the agricultural white paper for the National Water Infrastructure Development Fund, and he subsequently found, um, managed to convince ERC, which is no mean feat, to allow him access to another $2 billion to make sure that we build the water infrastructure for security and reliability that will be absolutely important if we're going to expand our footprint of agricultural, particularly horticulture and viticulture, over the coming years. Um, we're also working very hard in, in implementing the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. Um, that proves to be um, a continuing um, uh, challenge for us all, but coming from South Australia, I sort of think if I can survive that, I can survive anything. But today, quickly, I'd just like to um, focus on one particular area that I think is going to be extremely important in our delivery of profitability and uh, increased productivity, um, and that's innovation, which is obviously the topic of this year's conference. Um, you know, we certainly, um, as industry sectors, horticulture and, and viticulture, face uni unique challenges when it, when it comes to um, our production. You know, compared with other agricultural um, sectors, um, we're much more intensive when it comes to um, the amount and the cost of, of labour, irrigation requirements and many other inputs are very, very intense. That's why we might have to make sure that we're smarter and that innovation um, and R&D is particularly disproportionately more important to these industry or your industry sectors than many others. 
And so for that reason, you know, we are very keen to support Horticulture Innovation Australia to looking at some of the really exciting things they're doing and particularly commend them for their decision to do cross-sectoral research instead of just siloing their money down into the individual commodity sectors that sit within the horticultural space. And I was uh, great last year. I had the opportunity to go to the Sydney University uh, to launch um, the new $10 million um, robotics centre at the Sydney University and you know, try and drive around that little robot lady, ladybird. I think they saw after I had my first finger on the joystick, thought we'd better not let her drive it. But I'm sure every 13-year-old kid could probably drive this amazing piece of technology that uh, will stand um, the horticultural sector, particularly in fantastic stead into the future, by being able to target exactly where they need to do things. And the environmental benefit of that can, can't be understated if you're putting out a quarter or eighth or a tenth the amount of chemical that you used to be, because you can be more precise in where you're putting it, it's a win-win for everybody and, and hopefully it will add to the argument to make sure that we, uh, we can appease the, um, the ill-informed amongst us that live in the capital cities who don't think that we're as good a custodians of our land as I actually believe that we are. Um, so meanwhile, um, you know, organisations like Wine Australia are, are, are looking at um, projects and harnessing big data and doing all those sorts of things that will continue to allow us to lead the world in efficient vineyard um, management. So the, um, I think you know, the marketing opportunities, the innovation opportunities um, for our, our industries is absolutely immense. And can I just commend the RDC model that we have in Australia? I mean, despite the fact I always think we should be in a state of continuous improvement, I think our RDC model has certainly stood us in good stead and allowed us to be where we are today. So we certainly as a government understand the extraordinary and almost um, sort of essential importance of innovation in all of our agricultural industry sectors. Um, but the most important thing that we believe is that it can't just be pie in the sky. It can't be research for research's sake. Research isn't the outcome. The outcome is actually our ability to be able to adopt or for the farmers to actually agree to adopt that, uh, that research so that it actually starts delivering real results at the farm gate. And so that's why um, you know, we are absolutely committed to um, things like the R&D for profit programs because we believe that demonstrates that you've actually got to put the rubber on the road and the rubber on the road is better profitability and productivity on your farm. So my belief, as is the government's belief, is that constant improvement and access to the latest technologies, ideas, um, growth can and will happen, but without it, it won't. So thank you very much. <laughs>